Carl Morgan is a retired pastor, but he's been a really busy guy because those of you who are retired know that you only retire to get busier in life, and that kind of happens. But Carl has been working on this site that's on the, uh, uh, the PowerPoint behind me for 15 seasons now. 13 of the 15 seasons that this dig has been going on. And Carl is the uh, assistant to Dr. Stephen Collins, the archaeologist in charge of the dig. And if I said something wrong, he'll correct me, and that's okay. Meanwhile, he's been digging around in the ground at an authentic biblical site, and it's a doozy. And so let me introduce to you from Woodland, he's a local guy, Carl Morgan, Tell us about Sodom, brother. Yeah, I'm uh, <clears throat> one of the supervisors. I'm not really classified as one of the scholars with the uh, group. It's a, what a supervisor does is pretty much uh, grunt work. I'm classified as a field archeologist and I've always had an interest in archaeology, and that complements biblical studies and pastoring in a, in a great way, especially if you teach. And I've been fortunate to go to this site. I've known Dr. Collins more than the 15 seasons, probably 20, 25 years. He's a, he's a president of the Trinity Southwest University in a, uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico. So much of what I have to say is his thinking, because it, God laid it on his heart to find this site, to dig in it. It's in Jordan. I'll give you the location here and how important that is in a moment. But um, there are brochures for the museum that we operate in Woodland. How many of you have been to our museum? Okay. Well, then you, you need a field trip. Okay, <laughs> bring them on. And there's brochures for that in the back on a table there by the door. And you feel free to take one, take my car too. You wanna come, just give us a call ahead of time and we will be there. You let us know when you wanna come and we'll be there, whether it's one or 30, we'll, we'll be happy to have you there. It gets crowded after 30. So, uh, so make sure you, you come and visit our museum. It's a very nice museum, that's my other interest. I, I, do, I collect antiquities <clears throat> legally and uh, do the... Uh, <clears throat> see, see, when we're digging, you can't bring anything home unless it's pieces that uh, you find on the surface and they have to be stone or some beads or something like that. And I find quite a bit tools, there, but it, it, it has no context for where you're digging. Then you can bring it on home. So everything else has to come another way. But I'm not gonna spend a whole lot more time. Uh, I wanna get right into this because there's so much to say. And first of all, this is our site, Talal Hamam. It's about 62 acres total, and it's a large site. I'll show you the location of it in a minute. But why is it important that we identify Sodom? Well, the first thing is the existence and location of Sodom in the cities of the plain is a perfect test case for the historical accuracy of the Bible for at least three reasons, and here we go. One, the vast majority of scholars, including archeologists, historians, and theologians, seriously doubt or dismiss altogether their very existence. I am overwhelmed by the number of pastors that don't believe there's a Sodom. Or especially if you go to a school in their theology or biblical department, no matter how conservative, you're gonna find that many of those teachers do not believe there's a Sodom. I was trained in a school that uh, they taught it as a, an ideology, something to express, give an explanation for something in the past. And it, it's amazing to me because the Bible is very clear. It's so detailed. It's uh, obviously, it's a real, real place and we've proven it to be so. Also, most present day scholars who do believe in their existence have searched in vain for the cities of the plain in the Southern Dead Sea area, reinforcing the doubts of the skeptics. Only in recent days have we arrived at the conclusion uh, that Sodom is north of the Dead Sea instead of south. And all your biblical maps will have it down at the south with a question mark usually, because they don't really know. Well, 
it's uh, quite obvious. Maps are changing now, by the way, because people are starting to realize it's at the north end. And you, you'll find this in more and more. The newer uh, uh, commentaries and other biblical atlases will come out. And third, if a legitimate, scientifically rig vigorous, rigorous investigation into the whereabouts of these missing cities actually succeeded in finding them, it would be a huge confirmation of biblical credibility. I don't need this to believe the Bible's credible. Amen. But it sure helps those who are going through some struggles and doubts. To be. There's, there's been people come into our museum, I know at least one, who they, I tell them about Sodom, and they say, I always thought that was just a story. And there's some people came to Christ because of what we showed there about Sodom. You mean the Bible's true about that? And then you go in, well, it's true about everything else too. That's, it. That's important. Okay, so what do we need to do? First of all, you need to have the geography right. <clears throat> and the way this is, uh, where did it go? Okay, using the scripture in Genesis 13, this is a condensed version of just the key points in Genesis 13 uh, about what happened when Abram and Lot separated from their, they had too many flocks and they had to separate. And Lot chose the east and the Kakar of the east and Abram stayed right where he was, which is what God had in mind anyhow. And you can see here, so Abram went up to, from Egypt to the Negev. Lot went with him. And from the Negev, he went from place to place until he came to Bethel, to the place between Bethel and Ai. Lot looked up and saw that the whole plain of the Jordan was well watered like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt toward Zoar. So Lot chose for himself the whole plain of the Jordan and set out toward the east. Abram lived in the land of Canaan while Lot lived among the cities of the plain and pitched his tents near Sodom. You see, I circled one word three times. That's the word plain. It's, it's translated in your Bibles as plain or valley. This is the New International Version. You, it depends on what translation you got as how that's translated. But the word is actually a Hebrew word, kakar, and it means a, a disc in the Old Testament. And it, it, re, it refers most often over 50 times to a town, a meadow, or a circular flat loaf of bread, like a pita bread, you know, pizza, <laughs> something like that. We get them square now. And so this is the word kakar. Now, where is the kakar of the Jordan? It's right here. The kakar of the disc is right here at the north end of the, of the uh, Jordan River, uh, of the sea, Dead Sea, where the Jordan River flows into it. And this is a close-up of that, facing north, it's going this way. And you can see how the Jordan River flows down into the Dead Sea. It overflows its banks sometimes. That's a kakar. And if, you have, if you're able to stand over this, or even have a satellite imagery, you can look down and it's a circle. And it's a circular depression that's there geographically. It's very clear. And this was the Kakar that they were able to see from Bethel. Now, the thing that you have, let's say, is Lot traveled eastward from Bethel I, uh, pitching his tent toward Sodom. Well, you can see this is facing north, and that's south. You can see the Kakar. You can also see Bethel, where it's at. Now, the traditional sites for Sodom and Gomorrah are Babidra and Numera. And we found there's reasons why that doesn't work. Number one, they were 2,300, they're about 300 years to 500 years before Abraham was even born, that these were destroyed. So it's a problematic there. But also, you can't see down there from Bethel Eye. You ever stood up at Bethel and looked down there? You can't see it down there, the southern tip anyhow. But you can look out this direction and see the Kakar if you're in the right place. And that's looking that direction. Now, this is a picture from that site at Bethel, and you can see the Kakar of the Jordan. When that arrow, where that line is leading, is directly to our site, okay? And so you can see it. That's the vision or view that Abraham and Lot would have had. And as you move on, you can see this is looking from up on Mount Nebo. And I know, Pastor Jay, you've been on Mount Nebo looking down there. You can see our site. And the best way to find it is look for that reservoir down there, and it's right across the street. Now, where is it at? It's hard to pick out even in that, uh, but there it is. <laughs> if you, uh, that's what you have to look for. But it's uh, very easy for uh, a, anyone standing on Mount, Mount Nebo to see it. Now, that's down in the Kakar. 
Okay, it's 1,000 meters, Let's move on from that. Again, we come back to this. You have the Jordan River flowing down in here, and uh, these are, uh, okay, these are routes, roads and travel routes that were in place during this time. And it shows you how important this was. You have Jericho is there. You have our site and you have these other sites. And these, we know we, there was Sodom, Gomorrah, Admon, and Zeboim. And then, well, here you have a lot of other little uh, uh, towns that, are, that were villages that were close by. Here's the thing. When God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, it says he destroyed all the cities of the plain. Well, there's a lot more than Sodom and Gomorrah. You had Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, Zebuim is plural. And here you have, there they are. Kafrin is, is the Gomorrah. Nimrin is, uh, is Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma. And then uh, Zebuim is plural. So you need two side by side, and there it is. You have uh, Blaibo and Musta. So those are still there, and they were hit. And then all those little towns were hit, little uh, villages were hit too, and we found some of those. And some of those names are right there. They were all destroyed. They all just have the same footprint. Now we know even Jericho, we don't know what it was called back then, but even Jericho was there at that time of the destruction, and Jericho was hit too. That was found in the last two years. An archaeologist named Negro was there, and he said, yes, you have the same thing that happened at our site. So it was a terrible destruction. We're thinking maybe 50,000 people with all this combined. So we don't just think of one city when you think, oh, that's Sodom. All right, now we move on. Now, the Kakar of the Jordan was well watered like the Garden of the Lord, single river springs, that's the Garden of the Lord. And then like Egypt, which had the annual uh, river inundations, depositing new layers of water, you know, of laden silt, water-laden silt. And again, let's look what we had here as far as the water sources. Of course, you have the Jordan River. Am I standing in the way of anybody over here? Okay. And then, get to this. All right, now these are the sources of water that runs down through the wadis into this area, but there's always also springs, one at Jericho, and you find a lot of springs here. See, so it's well watered just as the Bible describes it, like the Garden of the Lord and also like the Nile that overflows its banks, so the Jordan River would overflow its banks. So it, was, it had a lot of water. It's the best watered agroscape in the region. So you have Tal and Hammam, it's got the right location. It's the largest Bronze Age city in the Eastern Jordan Disc. When you say Bronze Age, um, you're thinking of 2100 down to 1550 for the Middle Bronze. And that's, a, um, that's the destruction took place somewhere in the 18th century. I, I put it closer to the 1800s. Dr. Collins goes a lot earlier, but we're, a lot of tests are going on now to try to determine that, the exact. And this, is, this happened during that time frame. So we're in the right time frame. And the, we'll show that with the chronology. So first of all, we had, it's in the right place, just as the Bible said. It's not down south, it's up in the north end. And then we go to the story of Abram and Lot. It belongs to what's called the Middle Bronze Age. And that's the biblical date. And I'll give you some of the, what, how we, what, the, what this means. When you see a lot of these terms, calcolithic period, we have that at our side. I was the first one to enter into that. That's right after the uh, Tower of Babel, okay? That's where, and then you go from there to the, to the 10, um, to, the, to the nations that, that in chapter 10 of Genesis and the dispersion of the, of the peoples and the tribes. And you have the early Bronze Age, and you can see we have that at our source. Intermediate, we have that. We have the middle, and the late Bronze is time of Moses. Well, I'll show you that in a minute, well, how that means, Iron Age. And Hellenistic. We have all these at our site, but there's a, even early Roman, that's time of Jesus. Personally, I think Jesus visited our site in the Roman city there, so on that side of the Jordan. Anyhow, that's another story, isn't it? So you can see who's related to that. You have the Tower of Babel, Babel Calcolithic, the cities of Genesis 10. Now, you, you, the sons of Ham, descendants of Ham, settled at Sodom and Gomorrah according to Genesis 10. So when we're digging, in the early bronze period and the calcolithic period and there's a complete city underneath the one that was destroyed the early bronze period and that would uh, shows you uh, you're digging in the descendants of ham uh, the three sons of noah shem ham and japheth 
Ham, the Hamites became Sodomites. Okay? And then you have the Middle Bronze Period, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. The Late Bronze Period, nobody was there except Moses and the children of Israel for a short period of time. That's where they camped before they crossed over the River Jordan and conquered Jericho. So this is the time frames we're looking at for the Sodom and the cities of the Jordan Disc. And we, uh, we, we will be digging in those areas. Now this is just to let you know what I uncovered. I'm very fortunate to be able to dig and I must make a confession, I don't do a lot of digging. I do a lot of paperwork, and I tell people how to dig, and uh, I enjoy doing that. I, so I can point to that sort of thing, and do all the uh, elevations, and do the drawings, and that it's as a supervisor. But I did uncover this, because this is calcolithic, it reminds, that takes you back to, man, you're really close to Genesis 10. Uh, there, you're into Genesis 10. That's how early we go there. And then right, and that's Calcolithic. You're below that. You're, you're at, these people came from the Tower of Babel, okay? And that's, that's so exciting to be that early in history. That's what I uncovered. You can see the, the Calcolithic wall. It's a, called a broad house, and they're rectangular shaped. And then uh, later on, the people who were later early bronze people, uh, after that, they built on top of this wall. So that's, it's hard to distinguish that, but those two colors, we didn't find them in that color, but that's, <laughs> they were, uh, we added that. So Talal Hamam, this is back in 2000, 2007 and 8 season. That's my team there, I'm up on top, and these guys are all from Woodland. And we, by the way, if you ever wanna go dig, you're welcome to come. You just pay your own way, and, and uh, you actually pay to work. Is that weird? <laughs> I, I don't know. You get to visit other sites as well. But the middle bronze stratum is what we need for it to be biblical Sodom. And if you go down low enough, we dug through the Iron Age, which was after Sodom. See, the deeper you go, the earlier you get into history. And as we dug down, we found this ash layer that was three feet deep, and it's a massive destruction. So we were there. You can see us digging in that. It's a black and white. We started uncovering walls, and these walls were of a house. Uh, it turned out to be more than a house. It's actually a part of the palace of King, uh, the King Bera of Sodom that you find in the Bible, and that is what we're working on now, is the palace area. You can see the destruction. This is all middle, that's middle bronze pottery, and the Talal uh, Hamam, the, 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 it's all in ash, that's all you work in. Now, this is what really allowed us to say, well, we're there. We've hit that time frame. Let me see if I got one. Yeah. This is a uh, piriform, piriform juglet. And you see the one on the left. That's what I, we found in my square. And it was very exciting. Move this way. Yeah. OK. All right. Listen, if you just let me know, I'll be, ha I'll be happy. Uh, if you, this is it. If you want to see it afterwards, fine. It's real. I, I didn't steal it or anything. It came to us quite, quite legally. Man gave it to us from his collection back in, from back in the 1970s. But this is what we found broken. But this is what you needed to date. You date things by, it's called ceramic typology. And the, um, a good ceramic typologist can look at that and tell you what it was used for. All you need is a handle and they're called diagnostics. You need a handle, a base, or a rim, some, and some contour, the, the piece itself. And I got some of those here. I'll explain that in a little bit. So these are pieces that we found that said, you're in the right place. This is my square. This is the first square I dug. You probably saw that square if you were on top. Okay, this is the deep one. We had to go down 15 feet to actually reach this, working through these segments. See, that's the middle bronze two. That's Abraham's time. That's what we were looking for. Then we hit the Iron Age II was above that, and we're finding that that's a 200-year period uh, during that time frame. There's a line of cobble right at the base of uh, between that separates the Middle Bronze from the Iron Age period. When you say Iron Age, think King David, okay? King Saul, David, Solomon. It's from their time frame, and you're you're going so the, before that was Abraham, and there's a gap of 500 to 700 years. Nobody lived there after the destruction. This was, uh, why? Because it's at the a trade route, it's 
perfect defenses. It has a lot of water. This place was wiped out. Nobody wanted to live there. And I don't think the ground was suitable to grow anything for the, about 500 years. And now it's suitable now. And it was during the Iron Age because we find barley seeds there from that time frame. So, it's, uh, so what's the physical evidence that this place was destroyed by this great uh, destruction sent by God. Well, first of all, I thought this was nice because this is uh, one of our, the, the directors, the assistant directors, she gave this slide and a few of the others because what, what, what do people think when you think of an archaeologist, what they do? Because I'm going to show you what we do also. And, and first of all, what do people think I do? Well, Indiana Jones. Well, I've been introduced in years prior as the only closest to Indiana Jones and I said, you gotta be kidding me, you know. <laughs> Harrison Ford, I'm not, I'm 70 years old now, but so is Harrison Ford. He didn't look like the early Indian Indians either. So uh, what people think I look for is dinosaurs, no. Uh, we don't care, that's paleontology. We don't even deal with that. I wouldn't know what to do with one if I found one. And, uh, oh, let me go back, I'm sorry. Uh, what my dad thinks I do, this is from Carol. Carol was digging down here in the middle and playing in the sand, and she said, what, I keep just doing this, there we go. Okay, what people think I find is gold, we have yet to find any gold, and coins, but we find other types. What I actually do is dig in dirt, and what I actually find is a bunch of pottery and sand and stone walls. That's basically what you want. But that's what I look for, I like walls. Now, to start out a dig, you need someone to do a, a, a grid, and this is one of the local Jordanians, he does this. We divide our whole site into squares, 18 by 18 feet. We have 13,000 of them. In 15 years, we've done about 120. So we have a long way to go. But you don't have to do them all. You just do here and there. And you, if you figure that if it's this way here, it's also that same way, 100 feet that direction. <laughs> so you don't need it all. Then you, this is, these are the tools that you use, uh, goofas, and uh, we collect all those together, a lot of wheelbarrows, some pickaxe, but primarily, you, these are the tools you have, a petite, matter of fact, I'll just show you what we got here. This is, these are your primary tools if you go dig. It's very light. Anybody can handle that, it's a petite. No, no, it's a straight old Marshalltown trowel. Some of you guys and ladies, you've handled some of these, and buy them down at Home Depot. That's where I got that one. And then uh, this is called a goofa. It's just a rubber bucket, but it's easy to carry and dump into wheelbarrows. I'll show you what's inside in a moment. And that's my office. Okay. Uh, a lot of sheep around our site. A lot of sheep, goats, and camels come visit you on a regular basis. It's kind of fun. That's my restroom, private restroom. <laughs> Bananas, it's banana field. So people just kind of disappear in there. You see that movie, Field of Dreams or something? <laughs> How those baseball players just kind of disappear in the court. Well, that's what happens on our site. I don't know. Ours come back though. And this is what you do. You, that's a volunteer and she's carrying the goofa full of dirt. Sometimes it's wheelbarrowing dirt. Sometimes it's stones, and we hire guys to do the stones because some of them are pretty big stones. And um, then you sift through the dirt to find the smaller things that you're looking for, and this is what you look for. You don't find, we find a lot of whole pieces, but I'd rather not because it takes too long to get them out of the ground. All you need are these, these pieces that came out of the ground. I was able to bring these home. These are all called diagnostics. You need rims, and this is Iron Age. Here's a base, see the base? Here's, a, here's another uh, handle with rim. That's good, and this is, this is pretty early. I think this is, a, this is early bronze. And this is early bronze. You can tell that by, by the ledge handle. It's only made during that time frame. So a ceramic typologist looks at this and he can date that and tell you what it was. And Dr. Collins is one of the best in the world to do that sort of thing. That's what you look for. That's what you find a lot of. You have the pottery washed. If you can't dig, you can wash pottery. Yep, yeah. 
we, you got to wash it out. And then this is what I do. I draw pictures and, and uh, tell people what to do. Enjoy that. <laughs> Matter of fact, it, I, I just threw this in here. This is our staff. That we have the directors. You have Dr. Collins there in the middle. And then I'm next to him pointing. Then the assistant directors are on this side. The other supervisors are on that side. And I have no idea what we're pointing at, but it's really important. I know it is, because we all have an opinion, you know, <laughs> what it is. But it's in my square, I, I don't know. You have to take pictures, and you have to do other things, like do the drawings of the pottery to find the width of the mouths so that you can determine what it really is. You, uh, this is what they're doing. They mark the pottery. They save what they want to. They bag it, and it's stowed until it's uh, used at a later time to make final reports. A lot of it stays in Jordan, a lot of it comes back. You find small pieces, isn't that neat? That's one of the Jordanians' supervisors. And uh, yeah, it'd be perfume. And then you find great big ones. I found this one in one of my squares. But you can see what happens as we dig it out. And there you go. <laughs> it's a, unfortunately, when we cleaned it up, it fell all apart because the only thing holding it together was the dirt inside. So that's a pretty neat, uh, these are all Iron Age. It's, a, it's, it's about like that. You can see the meter stick beside it. And you find hordes sometimes. This is Roman period pottery down by the springs in the Roman bath. It's in the lower section. You find whole pieces that look like they just were made yesterday. Look at this piece and look at what it looks like when it came out of the ground. Isn't that beautiful? Not a scratch on the thing. And it's been in the ground for 3,000 years. You find taboons, which are ovens. This is how a taboon works. You, uh, you can see the cooking pot goes on top. You, it's made a clay on top of that. The bread goes inside to make the oven. That's what a taboon looks like. We find a lot of those, especially in the area we're working at now. And then you find a lot of ash. That's Dr. Collin collecting some of the ash, but what he's collecting is seeds. This is a bunch of barley seeds that goes back um, actually, I think these seeds go back to the Middle Bronze period, the time of Abraham. These got scorched in the destruction. And there they are. That's how you collect them. And these are seeds. We didn't even know what kind of seeds these were. We think they, uh, what did he say they might be? Coriander, possibly. And there's the barley seeds that you find. And see how they were found on the slide on the left? They, they, those were in situ, meaning right in place. And this is a barley seed that was destroyed. Those are Middle Bronze pieces uh, of pottery, so this was destroyed during the destruction of Sodom. Sometimes, this is a young man from our church. Sometimes you find really special. He found this ring. It's a seal ring. Um, you, this is what it looks like. It's made of, of um, what is it made of? It's made of horn, a black horn. It's very, very special. You find a lot of Food preparation items, you find a lot of jewelry, beads, rings. You find a lot of weights and scales, that side of type of thing. We find figurines that were false worship, idolatry. We find cosmetic palettes that women mix their makeups on and spreaders. We find scarabs and seals from Egypt because they had an influence there. We find games, that's a game board, and the bone, the knuckle bones are used as game pieces, the lower ones. We're finding those all over the place, and finally it dawned on us, uh-oh, they were used for something, and that's what we think they were used for. Weaponry, we find a lot of knives and, and ballistics, such as a sling stone and spearheads. We find tools. I find, I have so many of those Canaanian flint blades that you just find on the ground laying around. I probably found 200 of them. And so they're, they're around. Uh, the ax heads, awls, flint blades. This is the early Roman Byzantine pottery that we find. That's the time of Jesus in the early church. And you find the Iron Age pottery there. You're getting into Solomon and David, possibly Saul. First piece that came out of the ground was that one in the lower left. I found that on one, in one corner. And that's uh, that bullseye uh, decanter type thing. Not decanter. 
but it's a middle bronze period this time of Abraham. See the pieces come out in nice, nice condition considering what they went through. It's alabaster there in the middle, up, upper middle. And then the early bronze, you're getting into some, uh, this is what we find. And I even found this calcolithic at one point. So that was, uh, it was actually, we think this, it was in the right, wrong spot. It was in middle bronze period, time of Abraham. And it was, you had this calcolithic vessel in there for perfumes or whatever. And we figured it had got stuck inside of a mud brick somehow because that was the only thing we could figure. And there was crumbling mud brick all around, so it got stuck there. So we, you never know. We find these appliques, they're of the horns, the, uh, of the bull. We, and this is giving us a new twist on who lived there. Dr. Collins believes that a people called the Minoans lived there, and they weren't really Canaanites. And they brought in a lot of the Minoan from Crete, uh, uh, worship. There's even pillared walls or buildings, and it's all Minoan style of architecture. So maybe it is. All right. The city of Sodom itself was fortified with walls, the massive city gate complex in Genesis 19 1, because Lot entered, the angels of the Lord entered into the city of Sodom. Remember that? And Lot was in the city gate, the plaza, there to greet them and take them home with it because he didn't want them to stay there because it was too dangerous. That was one of the problems of Sodom. They lacked hospitality. They abused the guest, and they were going to do that. So he took them into his own home. Well, what do we have? Okay, here's Sodom, our site. I want to focus on the corner. Where's it at? Yeah, right there. Because that was called the rampart. Now, this is special. This is the rampart. That's the, the outer wall that slopes that you can see there. Now, what you have first that we want to look at, the time of Abraham and the destruction of Sodom was this lower area. And this is made, it doesn't look like it, you can't tell it now, but this is mud brick. And this is eight deep, possibly. We're thinking that there was at least 40 million mud bricks here, maybe 60 million and over the entire site up to 200 million, which tells us they had slave labor. That's the only thing slaves did. They made mud bricks. People didn't do that. So this was, a, we have never has been found a rampart for defensive purposes like this made out of mud brick. Okay, so they did that. This is the Iron Age fill from a later time. And then on top of that, they put a smooth glossy on it to make it hard for people to climb up. But that's the, uh, there's a, again, you have that occupational gap of 500 years to 700 years. It's more like 500. This is the wall system. We know we got to have walls. And here you have the, what's highlighted there is the early bronze wall. That would be the time of Genesis 10. And the later people, the time of Abraham, they used the earlier wall as a part of their defensive system and then they use the wall inside of that. Then they have a walk path there around, it's called a rim road around this city. And then on top of that, they put, I found out, I, I found these um, stabilizer walls as you go down to hold the, everything together. So you're looking at a distance here. Of, this is their defensive system. It's over a 33 times, you know, three, it's 100, 110 feet, basically, for the whole thing. Now, this is their defensive wall. So this was a huge place. And the walls are still there, but you only find, basically, here's, here's a better way to look at it, if you can. You got the, everything there. You, let's see if I, the city stone, stone wall foundation is the middle bronze. Then you have the internal stabilizers on the outside. And mud brick went up 30 to 40 feet on top of the foundations. And it was just, a, they were ready for anything coming. The 36 degree slope made it almost impossible for an army to walk up. Can you imagine an army uh, trying to climb up this wall, uh, this rampart, and you have thousands of, of these sling stones shooting at you, and they're something like that. And they're coming at you at 150 mile an hour because gravity pulls you. You got thousands of them. You're trying to crawl up the wall. This was 
quite a place to, to uh, now, this is what you find. There's a reason why we only find foundations. Something happened at this site that removed everything. It just blew it away. The entire site has been removed, mud bricks and all. We, I mentioned we have 30, 40 feet of mud brick. That'd be 18 feet wide. It's all gone. You can't even find them. Where, are, where is everything? Well, I think I'll be able to tell you in just a little, few minutes. So you have walls there. You have an in, inward wall, mud brick. You can see the mud brick. Up there in the corner is a tower. I'll show you what it is. This is the city gate. If you go and dig there, you can, just like the angels of the Lord and Lot walked into the city gate, you see the person standing. They're walking into the city gate of Sodom. And you go inside, and that's where Lot would have met the angels of the Lord. And it was pillared. See those stones? Those are pillar bases. And this is what it would have looked like. You have a tower on one side, a tower on the other side, two kill zone towers on the inside, right inside the gate, and then exits out. And Dr. Lane Rittmeyer, he's a premier, he's the best architectural archaeologist in the world, and he drills our drawings. And this is what he came up with for what it would have looked like. That's what Sodom would have looked like. It wasn't some little small place. This was major. And he superimposed this over the terrain that we had found, and that's pretty much what we think it would look like. But something happened. Oh, this is my thing. Uh, they have a temple there. It's the largest Canaanite temple found, I think. And it's about 75 feet in length and width 25, 35 feet. And we were digging it, came across, this is my team digging there. And we found this, these are, this is the outer wall. That's 10 feet wide. This temple had a 10 foot wide temple, but again, no mud bricks, no nothing. It's all gone. All we have left is stone foundations. And here's the other thing. All the stone foundations are shifted and it goes from the southwest to the northeast. Everything's going that direction. I mean, massive walls just moved, just moved, and nothing left on top. Okay, what happened? Here's a couple altars. I tore that one on the left down to do what you call coring to find the date of it. It's kind of a pleasure to do that. You know, who in their lifetime has the opportunity to tear down a Canaanite pagan altar? You know? <laughs> But two years, we dug for two years, came back the third season, and the local farmers had plowed it and filled it in with dirt and plowed it and planted bananas. So it's, it's down there somewhere, but that happens in archaeology. All right, this is the rampart, and this is what you find when you arrive. And as you arrive, uh, when you want to dig there, my task was to find that we saw some uh, indication of building there. So... We started finding this underneath. And those round circular areas are silos. This is all from the Iron Age where the older, the later people dug into the earlier structures and it turned into a storage city. And there's about, well, I'll show you what happens. You see that developing. And then ultimately, this is what's underneath. So you go from this What's underneath that? That. And I count nine silos right there uh, on the hillside. And there's hundreds of them. Up on top, you have, uh, this is the city gate up on top. But matter of fact, I'll show you something pretty neat. I, I don't know if you, right there in the middle, there's like a walkway. That is a walkway from the time of Abraham. And if you want to find the city gate, just follow that road. Just dig it out and follow that road, and you're going to find uh, that. It takes you up to the city gate. Then, this is in, up on top. These rectangular rooms are storage rooms. So this is from the time of Solomon and David. Solomon had a storage city uh, on the other side of the Jordan. This is one of them. So we, what, a, what a prize to find something like that. But there's more to it. Uh, this is what happens, this is what you find on top when you're digging, you start digging, and as a result, that's what's down, underground. So we're digging down into the city, 
There we're down, that's a wall I uncovered last time of, you have mud brick on top of the stone foundation and it's about five feet wide and that was blown away. The mud brick is, one course of mud brick is all that's left and on a wall that size, it should have been 30 feet. It's all gone. This is what the site looked like when I first saw it. And that's what it looks like now, same shot. That's underground. Now, real quick, the terms of destruction, what happened? Um, we have ash, ash layers over the whole site, a full meter of ash, about more than three feet over the whole uh, site. You have ash here, ash there, ash everywhere. <laughs> so that's what you find. That's from the destruction from the time of Abraham, 1750 BC, maybe during that time frame, maybe later. Dr. Collins is finding the, some mud brick walls that were low and they didn't get removed, but they got burned. Those are like stone. They got hit with heat so hot that it, they, they're like stone. They're, you, they're like rock. Then you go from there, there's one of them. There you have something interesting because this is one of the pottery sure that was found, one of the many, and it's bubbled and glazed like glass. And on the underside is perfectly normal. That on the right is trinitite. That's silica material that was burned and melted from the atomic testing in Trin at the Trinity site in New Mexico, the first uh, atomic bomb explosion. It's the same, same features. Same thing that happened on the right happened on the left. Only the one on the left lasted about five seconds. And then it ran, it melted, ran over the edge, and then it's done. So this was, uh, what do we got here? Something that happened at our site was about 10,000 degrees. I have some of this, it's roofing material that became like rock and stone. We do find some people. I haven't found a lot of people because they were blown away. And this fellow was cut in half by fire. And he, the upper torso, his femur bone here, it's carbonized at the point of penetration of the heat. And it's like stone. So yeah, we find people and not many because they were, and that's not a burial by the way. It was found in situ in the ash layer. And we found two more skeletons last season and they were being analyzed for DNA. So, cause we have full craniums, not almost full, but some teeth and it's gonna find out where they really came from. Were they Minoans? We don't know. Oh, sorry. This is a cairn for grinding wheat and it weighs 500 pounds. And it was blown 15 feet across the room from, where, from its perch and its stand. All right, what did that? This is pottery that was blown from the southeast to the northwest, no, the southwest to the northeast into the wall and embedded there. We find that all the time. So what do we find? This is uh, some of the recent testing in our decision discussion about what happened. We think a meteorite Air bursts took place. God uses floods, he uses earthquakes, and he uses meteorites. And it would have been a, possibly to do that much damage, 225 feet in diameter. They're trying, the scientists were trying to, these are secular scientists that put this together. And that type of size, it would enter the Earth's atmosphere at 37,000, almost 38,000 miles per hour. It would burst into a cloud of fragments at 1,270 meters or 4,200 4, feet. Yeah, the energy of the outburst is 22 megatons. One megaton is a million tons of TNT. And no crater, but large fragments may strike the surface. And the shock waves arrive five seconds after the detonation. And this would, so the sound density is 138 decibels. That's enough to rupture, rupture ear, eardrums and burst blood vessels. This is what's happening to the people when this event took place. Now we move on and there is more because the peak air pressure is up to 2360 per square, pounds per square inch. Uh, and 
that the human fatality is at 65. So what happened? They got burned, but there may not have been anything left to burn, is what I'm getting at. The people just crushed by the air pressure. Um, we don't know exact. well, we, I can't tell you that now, but we know exactly what the air pressure was, and it's way beyond that. So maximum wind velocity on the ground will be possibly up to 52,000 miles per hour, but how much do you need? Um, <laughs> Uh, a tsunami impact took place from the Dead Sea because our ground has um, mineral deposits and on our site, 8% of the soil, 6 to 8% of the soil is, is mineral deposits from the Dead Sea. How'd that get there? It came that direction and coated our site with 10,000 degree <laughs> mineral deposits from the Dead Sea. Wow. So that may give you an understanding of Lot's wife. So she turned to a pillar of salt. Well, she got hit. That's basically it. There's probably a lot of pillars of salt that day. It's another, I think it's another way of saying she got stuck and got caught because she lingered behind and looked back. She didn't keep up and she got hit. So you got the ground temperatures were at least 4,000, 8,000 centigrade or Celsius, and that would be seven to 14,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay. Many are saying it's higher than that. 150 degrees centigrade is lethal to all human life. So we're talking about seven to 14,000. And the approximately 50,000 people were destroyed by this, uh, this event. So, that's what happened at Sodom. Oh, I want to show this. If I, it'll, if it'll work, it might not move. Oh, there it comes. One, two, three, four, five. It's done. That's, what, that's how long it took for Sodom to be destroyed. Everybody's dead. The city's eliminated. It's gone. Those people didn't know what hit them. Okay. So how do we know all this? It's very, it's very clear scientifically. <laughs> Analysis is very clear. We don't have to, a lot of the information I give you is given to us by men who went over there on their own to do their testing. They're not even Christians. They don't even believe the Bible to be accurate, but they believe this to be accurate. They say, yeah, this happened. This destruction happened at, the right, at that time frame, in the right place, just like they'll say it, just like the Bible says. So, so. You've got the um, right place, you got the right time, and you certainly have the right stuff. Welcome to Sodom. <laughs> That's what we've got. All right, I want to take questions because you may have a lot going on. I think we got a little bit of time for that. Yes? I uh, want to ask you, where's the fire and brimstone coming? Fire and brimstone would be the meteorite. It, the word there means um, actually uh, heat, fire, and light. So there's a color in the gofrit is it, lightning. Okay, and this type of thing brings lightning with it as well, and you would have a. It's a major destruction. It's just uh, like the fire is. You're talking about the heat. That would be there, the whole place, and something burned. Abraham saw this ash cloud arise from a distance, all the way in Hebron, and it set back down. That was, this thing creates a vortex that just sucks everything in, raises it up into the sky, and drops it back down. Then it rained down on Sodom, and that whole valley, this whole valley was like this. And it rained down upon them. You got pottery, you got mud bricks, you got people. That's where it all went. Yeah, and there the rest of it just swept out into that valley. Um, I can't imagine <laughs> how bad it would be. Yes? Yes, uh, Lot had asked God to spare a, a city or a, a town on the outskirts. Zoar. Yeah. yeah. It, and it's small. We don't know where that's at. Dr. Collins thinks it's down in one of the um, wadis, right? It's down the south side on the on the Dead Sea about halfway down 
you can walk it in a few hours. And that's what he wanted to go to. He didn't want to go up to where Madaba is and up on that area. He didn't think he could make it. But it's interesting that God would not destroy the city till Lot was gone. And that tells you something about righteousness. God, the angel said, I can't do anything until you're out of here. God preserves our world because of righteousness. You know, there wasn't, Abraham made a bargain with the angel of the Lord, with God. And he said, well, can you find 50 righteous people? Will you spare it? He said, sure, I'll do that. If I find 40, will you spare it? He got all the way down to 10. He said, yes, I'll spare it if there's in. There wasn't 10. There was one. He was willing to spare the city if Lot was there. He did not carry out his destruction until he was gone. And then there wasn't anybody left. Not a righteous person in that whole valley, 50,000 people. Not one had a right relationship with God. And that's what brings judgment when you don't have a relationship with God. So righteous people are very important. <laughs> Anybody else? What's the measurement? Uh, you have black and white um, into white bars. What is that measurement? And what is where the red and white? Like For the walls? Oh, that's a meter is 39 inches. Which part was which? You have the, you, the, lar, lar, the black and the red and white is the meter stick. Okay. That's the large one. Okay. I should have asked that at the yeah. time. I think, Jay, you wanted to say something at this point. Okay? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. technical thing here this is uh, it's worth it there, you go. there we go thank you so much I'm going to read two things before we conclude here today and we're just about done and again thank you so much what I love about what you do and what Dr. Collins does let's get the proper mic here about what you do and what Dr. Collins does Collins does, is that you are scientific and you are scientists and you call in other scientists. And something that I really like, and I was talking to a pastor about this yesterday, is that when you're able to bring in scientists who don't believe at all in God or the Bible and they affirm the Bible, <laughs> then you know you really got your hands on something because they don't even believe, so they don't have agenda that they could be accused of having some sort of special Christian facts or something like that. Um, very, very remarkable. And, uh, and again, there are a lot of books, a lot of theories about a lot of biblical events and what have you that are not done in a manner which is as thorough as this, which is why I'm so glad that uh, Carl lives so close by and he can come in and share all of this with us. There was a book, actually he said, you said there were three, but one of them was written by Dr. Collins, and you want to tell us about these books? I'll show it to you. Not the Bible, we thought. <laughs> that was written by somebody else. I'll just hold these. Okay, uh, the first one is, the, the and you're going to share from that, it's Discovering the City of Sodom, written by Dr. Stephen Collins, and you can pick these up online in the, and buy them. Uh, but this tells you the story, and that's the one you have. Okay. The next one is The Destruction of Sodom, and it's by Phil Sylvia, one of the so, so associates there, what we have learned from Tal and Hamam and its neighbors. And it's a, it's a book that, you again, you can pick this up on, um, online through Amazon or whatever. And it's, it tells you the scientific details, if you're into that. It gets very detailed and technical. And I'd like to give that to you. Thank you. Okay? Thank you very much. I'm not giving you this one. This is the <laughs> Harvest Handbook of Bible Lands. It's the most recent thing from Dr. Collins. It's a nice commentary and a handbook, a biblical handbook. Uh, I've got a few articles in here, too. So if you want to uh, go online and pick that up, too. It's really well, well done. Called again? It's called the Harvest Handbook of Bible Lands. Very good. Those are neat. Thank you. 
In Dr. Collins's book, Discovering the City of Sodom, this one here, which has a very bright, colorful cover on it, um, that's right, these things, if it can survive 3,000 years, it can be bumped by a, by a book. Uh, but in there, uh, the, one of the last chapters in the book gives a dramatic, but not overly dramatic, probably an unrelated account of what really happened in Sodom. I'd like to read that to you from the book, a slightly edited version so that it's a little bit shorter. But this is what it says in the book. The final fateful day when the Bronze Age ended in the Eastern Kikar was about 1650 BC. Could have been a little bit earlier than that even. One moment the sun was rising, casting its rays on the enormous fortified walls of Sodom. Inside, people were going about their self-centered, indulgent lives. Perhaps some had breakfast, while others had hangovers. Still others had the taste of dissipation in their mouths, and they arose and mused how they could advance their lifestyle and their influence. Men and women alike looked to the inevitability and security of a new day, believing that their mighty city walls and their great riches and their king protected them. Without warning, the sunlight dimmed in the glare of a terrible blinding light from the sky. Within seconds, a sudden flare of light incinerated everything it slammed into. Sand melted into glass. Exposed pottery in courtyards and on rooftops liquefied into a glassy green glaze, trinitite. All exposed life vaporized, and anything and anyone protected from the blast was torn apart. Limb from limb, branch from tree, Gates and arms and legs burst from their sockets. Even in the safety of their houses, bodies were shattered, blasted into the corners of rooms. In the same split seconds, the blinding, searing objects com object completely disintegrated as it entered the atmosphere. A fireball so consuming, so voracious, that it even devoured itself. The instantaneous blast unleashed a deafening shockwave that slammed into the Kikar at an oblique angle, ripping into agricultural fields and living surfaces, knocking whole cities completely off their foundations, tearing mud bricks from their hidden base blocks, a concussion crushing them to dust in the blink of an eye. It tore open the northern edge of the Dead Sea, blasting a superheated supersonic chemical slurry northward towards so Sodom and her doomed sister cities, like a tsunami of white-hot liquid salt enveloping the southeastern side of the valley. The cooler surrounding air rushed into the superheated impact zone, momentarily a vacuum spiraling heavenward, a monstrous black tornado miles high a dreadful column that opened up into the cold vacuum of space where the object had punched a hole in the sky so that the atmosphere itself collapsed down upon the instantaneous cataclysm. The huge column swirled upward towards space, a great shaft of smoke and debris that plumed into an enormous black vortex, a mushroom cloud spiked with great fingers of white hot lightning, terrifying distant observers transfixed by the spectacle of death and obliteration. Seconds earlier, Sodom had been the shining jewel of the Kikar's dream, green fertile plain. Now it literally leaped in the shockwave, momentarily suspended between earth and sky while touching neither. Meanwhile, 45 miles away near Hebron, Abram was startled by a brilliant flash coming from the northeast. Then, the earth convulsed with a sudden violent jolt, a deafening thunder, a hot, dirty wind, and he knew what it was. He turned in the direction of the tumult and saw the dense, horrible smoke rising from the tops of clouds above the air itself beyond sight. Abram, broker of deals, cutter of covenants, had bargained for every soul in that great city, and they were no more. Within minutes, the deafening roar receded into a distant groan. The dirty wind slowed, and the upward surge stopped. And then it began to rain over the Kikar. Not water, but bits and chunks of heavier debris now falling into the dying vortex. Fragments of newly formed fused glass, fragments of bricks, fragments of pottery, fragments of idols and weapons and people and ash falling like a blizzard of black snow. For one eternal moment, the Kikar convulsed and sucked the air from every lung. No eyewitnesses remained, for every eye melted in the blast. 
No time for thought or panic. It all took just a few seconds. Merciful indeed, no one who experienced it survived to tell the story. The ancient mind didn't know how to process such an awesome cataclysm. How could they speak of something for which there were no words, except to say that it was like fire, like lightning, like sulfur, like the blast from an open furnace door, something you turned away from lest it destroy you too. The fires smoldered for days, weeks, or even months. The ash fell so thick and black and terrible that no one would approach the devastated site of Sodom again for almost 700 years. Sodom, whose city, the city whose name was whispered in fear, in dread, in threat, in curse, until it became part of all vocabularies. It became the stuff of all nightmares. And it happened. And you just saw. Ezekiel chapter 16, verse 49, simply says this about why all this happened. Of course, Carl told us it was all about righteousness and unrighteous. There was only one righteous man in the city, and he got pulled out, and out he went. upon the city. What was the problem with Sodom? Of course, people could immediately shout, Sodomites, homosexuality, and all of that. Here's their problem. And this was unrighteousness. And by the way, this is the stuff of many sermons. So all I'm going to do is read it to you and we'll conclude. Ezekiel 16, 49. Now this was the sin of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters, the smaller towns and villages surrounding it, were arrogant, overfed, and unconcerned. They did not help the poor and needy. They were haughty and did detestable things before me. Did you get that? This is why God destroyed them. She and her daughters were arrogant, overfed, and unconcerned. They did not help the poor and needy. They were haughty and did detestable things before me. Therefore, I did away with them as you have seen. And therein is the whole lesson, right out of the mouth of God. Father, thank you, Lord, for just opening our eyes to things today. And I pray, Father, that we remember this, such a concise statement that you made through your prophet Ezekiel. That, Lord, we never forget that it wasn't the gigantic evils that we perceive, but the fact of unconcern for one another, and for others, and for those in need, for haughtiness and self-centeredness. Oh Lord, thank you for having mercy on us thus far, but help us also, Lord, to live righteously, knowing that you made us holy through Jesus, but as a result, Righteousness is what we do now. May it always reflect you in the way that we bless and benefit others. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, Amen. Amen. Let's all stand.